Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, once again, Beaverton Grace, I love coming up here. I love spending time with Pastor Chuck and his family. I love the saints here, and I thank you for your love that you've shown me over the years and the, the times that I've been here. Um, I just want you to know that you're prayed for often. Um, I thank my brother Jeff Rose for allowing me to be a part of his ministry as well, allowing Mike and I to partner with him in different places around the world. I love my brother Mike Gendron. There's been at times in the past where I've uh, helped with this table back there. And uh, I really appreciate you, Brother Mike, and your ministry. And, uh, and each and every one of you, thank you so much for this privilege and opportunity to be here. Dale and Lori, I thank you so much for being like my second parents and uh, taking us in and allowing Mike and I to stay with you. And I want to thank uh, Mike Stockwell as well for being my uh, co-labor in the ministry. Uh, we drove here together, we've been together pretty much since the middle of June, together, connected at the hip. Uh, we went to Belize, we went to, to England, Wales, Ireland, we came back, we went to New York City, um, Portland, Maine, and now here we are in Portland, Oregon. So we've traveled a lot of miles together. And I pray that God will, you know, allow us to die together, preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, I'd like to start off with saying this, is that the Bible is filled with many questions. I think great questions that we can preach from. Those of you who are open-air preachers, it's filled with just great questions that we can use to engage the culture. Here's one that, that's in the book of Job. It says, How then can a man be right before God? How can he who is born of a woman be pure? See, these are the things that we need to think about for ourselves especially, and also for those that we go to engage in the culture, those who we go to share the gospel with. And I want to talk to you today uh, about two questions that Jesus asks. And these are two great questions that we need to have an answer for. And I think it's a great way for us to go out and share the gospel with people. So if you would, let's turn to Matthew chapter 16. And I'll read from verse 13 to the end of the chapter. What I'm going to talk to you today is about Islam. Do Muslims believe in Jesus? Uh, a few years ago, I was at a church, and this woman came up to me, and she said, Robert, do you ever talk to Muslims? I go, yeah, I do. She goes, 35 years ago, I talked to some Muslims, and this is what I told them. It's all about Abraham. It's all about Abraham. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, that's not the message that we're called to declare today. It's all about Christ. Amen. We're called to declare Christ. We're called to preach Christ and be crucified. It's not about Abraham. And maybe our Muslim brothers think that. But like this lady who said she talked to a Muslim 35 years ago, it's not like that today because Muslims are everywhere. And they're, and they're seem to be growing and growing and growing. So if you haven't come in contact with any Muslims, there's a day coming when you will have the opportunity to share the gospel with many Muslims. Like I said, we were in England, we go over there, you know, there's some cities where they're 25% Muslim. And it, it allows us to just share the gospel with many, many Muslims. Especially when we preach in the open air, hand in tracks, one-to-one -one conversations. And over there, they come over to you. They come over to you. And I imagine the same thing is going to happen here. That the Muslims will start coming to us and we need to be be prepared to share the good news of the gospel with you, just like we do with everybody else. But what is it that Muslims believe? Here, you'll probably get this as I read through the scripture here. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From, this, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a great hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him take, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? And what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let us pray. Merciful God, we praise you and we thank you for your goodness and your truth. We praise you and we thank you for this day. For this is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, Father. We thank you that you are sovereign over all things, that you revealed yourself to your children, that you are triune, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We thank you for sending your Son, Christ Jesus the Lord, to die a bloody and cruel death that we might have eternal life through him. Jesus, we thank you for your obedience unto death. We thank you that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Lord, I ask now that you would hide me behind the cross, that you would allow me to speak your word, and in spirit and in truth, the Lord. I don't feel adequate for such a task, Lord. I just ask that you would speak through me. Lord, and I pray that you would give the saints ears to hear. I pray that you would use us word, this truth, that we be edified by the preaching of the word. But we love you and we praise you and we thank you for a time such as this. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said, the Bible has many questions that we can use to share the gospel with people or get us thinking in these, in these lines of who God is, who Christ is. Who, who, who man is before a holy, righteous, and just God. And I believe Jesus has two questions here. He says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? That's the first question. And then the second one is, but who do you say that I am? See, it's good for us to know what other people think about who the Son of God is, or who the Son of Man is. But Jesus asked us, who do, who do you say that I am? Who is it that we say that Jesus is? How do we look at Christ? And I think these are two great questions. And if we have an answer for these two questions, it'll tell us, you know, we've been learning about Catholicism. You know, there's been other times when we talk about Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, um, Roman Catholics, these, all these different groups. And who is it that they say that Jesus is? Who does the world say that Jesus is? And then he comes back and he asks his disciples. He's been training them. He's been discipling them. He stops them on the, on the road to Caesarea Philippi. And he asks his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Usually when we see this word, Son of Man, most of us think of the humanity of Christ. I believe that Jesus here is actually speaking about his deity. You know, that's something that we, that we overlook. Um, Augustine said that the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men might be made sons of God. In the Gospels, this term, Son of Man, is used over 80 times by Jesus. And then there's three instances where, there, where, there, where it's used and it doesn't come from the lips of Jesus. Um, in the Hebrew, Son of Man means mankind. In the book of Ezekiel, the Lord is reminding Ezekiel that he's, he's merely human, of his mere humanity. And Jesus uses this phrase, 
from the book of Daniel to refer to himself. And he asks, who do they say that the Son of Man is? This, I don't want to say mystical figure, but this messianic figure that's going to come. And reading from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. See, Jesus uses the same term when he stands before, before the high priest as they go to kill him, before they condemn him. They ask him, are you the Christ? And Jesus responds, and he says that he is the son of man. And what happens? They rent their clothes, saying they cry out blasphemy. They, they, they were saying that he was saying that he is the son of God, that he is God. Jesus knew exactly what he was saying when he used this term. Um, and, and, and oddly enough, he can, like I said, he, he uses this term over 80 times in the Gospels, and the people did not seem to understand what he was saying when he said it, except when this time when the, when the, uh, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priests rent their clothes. They knew exactly what he was saying. In the other instances where it talks about Jesus as the Son of Man is in Acts 7.56, Stephen, before he's stoned, he says he looks up and he sees the Son of Man in the book of Revelation 1, uh, 13 and 14, 14. Jesus used this term as a personal pronoun at times. And other, uh, other times he uses it to emphasize his identity as a Messiah. He said that he would suffer and die. Mark 9, 12 and 31. Mark 10 and 33. 14, 21. And 41, he would, uh, he said that he would give his life as a ransom for many in, in uh, Matthew 20, 28. He said he would be raised from the dead, Matthew 17, 9. He said he would return to the earth in great splendor, Luke 17, 24. He says he who, he who came to forgive sins and to interpret the law, Luke 5 and 16. And he will come back and judge mankind, Matthew 13, 41. And Jesus uses the same term to show his authority. If you would turn with me in the book of John, chapter 5. Starting at verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father do. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives, life, gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He has not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who will hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to, to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when he, when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Jesus Christ being the son of God and being the son of man. He's talking about him as being God. I think that's one of the most important things that we need to preach is declaring Jesus as God. Uh, there are two passages which Jesus used to, shows, to show his humanity, his messiahship, and his deity all at once. And this one that we're looking at in Matthew 16 is one of them. The other one is in John chapter 3, verses 
13 and 14, just before, when he's talking to Nicodemus, he's showing that he's God, that he's a, the son of man who uh, descends and ascends. So now, like I said, I wanted to talk about do Muslims believe in Jesus? Here, Jesus shows himself to be God. And he asks, who do people say that the Son of Man is? You know, so the Muslims, they say what, basically what the people were saying at that same time. They said, um, and they said, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. See, that's the main thing that the, that the Muslims use. They say that Jesus is one of the prophets. See, they have over 100,000 prophets, 124,000 prophets. And there's some that they list in the Quran. There might be like 28 that are listed in the Quran. 22 of those prophets are in the Bible. They say that Jesus is a prophet, but they, they don't really clarify what that actually means, being a prophet. Um, they say that he's one of the major prophets. You know, it's one of the titles that the Quran gives Jesus. Would you believe that the Muslims think that they give more honor to Jesus than Christians do? You know, you can almost say that. Because if the Western culture believes that they're Christians, and they dishonor Christ by blaspheming his name, not giving honor to him, I can see why they might say that they give more honor to Christ than we do. You know, Jesus has all these titles listed in the, the Quran. He's mentioned 25 times in the Quran. And he's usually mentioned with Mary every time that his name is mentioned. And it says that, uh, it says that Jesus, the son of Mary. Our Bibles say that Jesus is the son of God and that he's the son of man. So they deny Christ right there. Um, he's mentioned more times than Muhammad in the Quran. You know, you wonder why Muslims think what they do about Jesus. You know, I would say that some of them probably read it in the Quran, but I think they're just repeating back, parroting back what they're told by their, by their imams. Um, like I said, he's alluded to over 93 times in the Quran. And like I said, the, the Quran denies the sonship of Jesus Christ by just declaring him as the son of Mary. So basically, they're just saying he's just a man. He's just a man. Um, the Quran speaks of some of his miracles. It, it, it notes some of his characteristics. It says he was born as a sign for all men, but specifically to the people of Israel. So basically they see him as a prophet that would go to Israel. They call him the Holy Child, that he's blessed of God. They, they say that he's born of a virgin. In the, the Quran, it, it calls him Muhammad's Lord. Um, says that he was a sinless prophet. And he is one, and he is the only one that is referred to as the Messiah in the uh, Quran. But again, they don't list out what, this, what that actually means. And it says that he has the power to create, to raise the dead, to heal, and to cleanse lepers. It says that he's alive in heaven. And that one day he's going to return, get married, have some children, and then he's going to die. And then Muhammad will be raised up. I mean, it's, uh, I think the most offensive term that the Muslims see is, or when they hear us talking about Jesus, is us calling him the Son of God. They find it very offensive, like Mike alluded to earlier. How could God become a man? You know, they said, you know, did, does God have a wife? Was he married to, to Mary? You know, that's kind of how they look at it. They just have this misunderstanding of who Christ is, him being the Son of God. You know, they, they treat him like he's a mere man, uh, but we need to be ready and prepared to talk about who, who he is. You know, we need to talk about him that he is God by nature. When we say the Son of God, we're saying that he's of the very nature of God. That means that he is God in the flesh. You know, um, we always need to talk about him as being the Son of God, that he is eternal, that he's unique, that he's the second person of the, of the Trinity. You know, one of the questions that we get asked all the time, I imagine if you have the opportunity to talk to Muslims, 
You're going to say, where in the Bible does Jesus say that he is God? You know, that's always a question that they, that they have. Um, so the one big thing is they deny him as the son of God. They deny him as being God. And then the next big thing that they deny is the cross. There's one verse in all of the Quran that talks about the cross. And it basically says that Jesus didn't die on the cross, that somebody else took his place, that his face was changed, or that maybe it was uh, Judas died in this place, or Simon the Cyrene took his place. Now think about that. They they've been taught from birth, and I would say by the devil, through the Quran, that Jesus isn't God, and that he didn't die on the cross. The two most important things I, that, that we need to be saved from our sin. You know, how deceptive is that, that the devil would use this? And basically, if you think about it, every religion that you come in contact with outside of Christianity, they always get Jesus Christ wrong. They always get the second person of the Trinity wrong. He's not God. He's just a man. He's a little God. You know, he was created. All these different things that men say about Christ. Um, in, in, in the Quran, but they, they provide no context. There's no explanation. There's no defense of why they would say that Jesus didn't die on the cross. The, the 600 years between the time that Muhammad came on the scene and Jesus dying on the cross and being raised from the grave, nobody said that, that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Nobody said that. Even today, it's probably one of the most widely known facts in all of history that Jesus died upon the cross. And yet, the people of Islam, they just deny it. Because, I don't know, maybe it was Muhammad. I would say Muhammad, when he went out, every time he saw a cross, a cross he would break it. He would crush it. You know, Satan hates the cross of Christ. This, this cross that we're called to declare to a lost and dying world. They deny him who came to set the captive free. We know that these people are steeped in their sin, they're in bondage to the devil, and they deny the only thing that can set them free from their sin. Jesus talks about, uh, well, they say, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Brother Jeff talked about John the Baptist yesterday. Uh, him and Elijah are eternally linked uh, through the scriptures. The, and why would uh, we say that? Because they, they asked John the Baptist if he was Elijah. Uh, in the, the last book of the Old Testament, it says that Elijah is going to come back. And so when John the Baptist, an Old Testament prophet, burst on the scene, saying, Behold the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, they're like, Are you Elijah? And he says, I'm not. But he comes in the power and the spirit of Elijah, because Jesus refers to him as being Elijah. He comes in the power and the spirit of Elijah, preaching this message. And the thing is, think about it. Jesus comes. Jesus comes the first time. John the Baptist comes out to prepare the ground, pre preaching a message of repentance. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Think about it. That's the same message that we're supposed to go out and declare. Christ is going to return again. We're supposed to go out with the same message as John the Baptist, calling men to repent and believe the gospel, just like John the Baptist did. That's what we're called to do. Um, others say Jeremiah, one of the other prophets, I imagine because of the tenderness in the compassion of Christ, him weeping over Jerusalem. Maybe that's why they linked him to uh, Jeremiah. But he says to them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And I think uh, with this question, who do we say that Christ is? And Peter's response is, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And I think what that means for us is that we need to be prepared to declare and to talk about the person and the works of Jesus Christ. You need, you know, talking to people and trying to encourage them to share their faith. People say, I'm busy. You know, I can't study all of these things that I need to study to be able to witness to people. But if we study the person and the work of Jesus Christ, we'll always be prepared 
to share the good news of the gospel with whoever it is that we come into contact with. We need to declare the person of Jesus Christ. And I would say that he is God. He shows himself to be God. What does Jesus do to show himself to be God? He cleanses lepers. He healed the centurion's servant. The Bible says that he heals many. That he calmed a storm. Imagine being in a boat with Jesus and he stands up and calms a storm. What do they say? They said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the seas they obeyed? They knew that they were in the presence of God. He cast out demons. The demons knew that he was God. They said that you are the Holy One of Israel. He healed a paralytic. He forgave sin. Well, think about that. That's a great story there with Jesus. You know, he's, he's preaching in a, in a house that's full. Uh, some men come, they rip open the ceiling and lower down their friend. And Jesus said, because of their faith, your sins are forgiven. He says, your sins are forgiven. And they said, who can forgive sins but God? You know, it's not popes and priests. Only God can forgive sin. And I think that's just a great story to share with Muslims. And with your Roman Catholic friends as well. Uh, he heals a woman with an issue of blood. He heals blind men. Men are steeped in their blindness today. Christ is the only one that can open up their blind eyes. He makes a mute man speak. He cures a man with a withered hand. He walks on water. Ask your Muslim friend, did Muhammad ever walk on water? He feeds over 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And he does an encore. He feeds over 4,000 with seven loaves of bread. And he raised the dead. He raised a little girl from the dead. He raised a young man from the dead. He raised his best friend from the dead. He raised himself from the dead. We need to preach Christ as God. He shows himself to be God. The person of Christ. He is God. The Son of God. God, the Son, the second person of the Trinity. He is the mediator between God and men. How is it that he can mediate between God and men? Because he's God and man. 100% God, 100% man. But there's one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave his life as a ransom for all. Now think about it. Christ was lifted up off the earth between God and man. And God put out his wrath upon him, the wrath that we deserve as sinners, we might be set free from our sin. But Christ said, he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And there he was, lifted up between God the Father and men upon the face of the earth. He's the invisible image of God. He's God in the flesh. He's the brightness of God's glory. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And we know that no man comes to the Father but through him. Him being the nature of God. One of the things that I like to do when I witness to anybody is that I bring out my, bring out my Bible. You know, we go out and we witness to people, but one of the things that we fail to do is to bring out the Word of God. I know that we know a lot of Scripture, but I think the best thing is to open the Scripture and show them exactly what we're talking about. We can say, here, read it for yourself. And then their argument isn't with you, it's with what, what the Word of God says. One of the things that I try to, to, to do when I talk about Jesus being God, I just kind of go down this steady little thing. I say, well, his friends said that he was God. His enemies said that he was God. And he said that he was God. And I use the book of John, and I'll just write maybe down at the bottom of the page the next scripture that I want to turn to so I don't have to remember all of these uh, different scriptures. John 1.1, 1, 1. John says that he is God. Uh, 2028. 20, um, Thomas says he's God. My Lord and my God. And I say, was Paul one of the disciples? Did, did they, one of the apostles? And they go, yeah. And I go, well, in Titus 2, 11 and 13, he says that he is God. Was Peter one of the disciples that walked with Jesus? Yes. 2 Peter 1, 1. He says, says that, that Jesus is God. And like the, the next one, his enemy said that he was God. When Jesus talked about him working as his father is working, they said not only did he break the Sabbath, but you being a man, make yourself equal with God. And then in 10, uh, 31 and 33, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And they try to kill him again because they knew exactly what he was saying, that he was God. 
And then Jesus said he is God. In uh, John chapter 8. I'm sure you all are familiar with, with the verses. But usually when I show this to people, I take them to a, a Exodus chapter 3 first. And I, where it talks about Moses. And he says, who shall I say sent me? And he says, I am. When God says, I am. And here Jesus says the same thing to those Jews, he says, before Abraham was, I am. And I, you know, I, I explain this to my Muslim friend, or before I show it to him, where in the Bible does Jesus say that he's God? I go, there's nowhere in the Bible where Jesus says that he's God. He says it much stronger. He says it much stronger that I am God. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And he says that God told Moses that that would be his name forever. That would be his name forever. I said, so, if I show that to you, are you going to bow your knee and worship Jesus as the Lord? You know, most of the time they say no. But I've told them the truth. That one day they will bend their knee. That one day they will give an account to Jesus as Lord. So there we have the, the person of Christ. And I think we talk about the work of Christ when he talks about him being Christ. So first you have the person, the Son of God, and then you have the work of Christ, him being the Christ. Him who came down from his heavenly throne, he put on flesh, became a man, died a bloody and cruel death on the cross. He comes to die as a substitute for sinners. It says the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. It comes as a propitiation to appease the wrath of God, to appease that which we deserve as sinners. So we need to talk about who God is. We need to talk about who man is, that he's a sinner. We know that Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. We know that God said that he was going to satisfy well, he was going to bring uh, Christ to crush the head of the serpent and the, the proangalia that, uh, that they looked for the Christ, that him who would come to save the people, um, exchanging his righteousness for our unrighteousness, the godly for the ungodly, that he would come. And uh, as John the Baptist came, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Um, what is it that all men deserve? We deserve to be crushed. We deserve to be crushed by God. We deserve to go to hell to this place where we'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we know this because Christ came and he told us about this place. And that's one of the things that we need to remind our Muslim friends of. When I finish a conversation with them, especially after they rejected the truth. I tried to leave them hanging over hell. Like Jesus said, he says, if you do not believe that I am, if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. And if men die in their sin, they will go to hell. And that's one of the things that I try to stress, is men being sinners. They have a sinful nature that we inherited from Adam and Eve, and then men willfully sin against the God that they do know. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin, and God provided the perfect sacrifice in His Son, Christ Jesus the Lord, that we might have eternal life. Christ came knowing that He was going to die before the foundation of the world. He would come and die for a particular people, Him whom the Father set His affections upon, Christ coming as the second person of the Trinity to redeem those who belong to Him. His name shall be called Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sin. And then the third person of the Trinity goes out and he finds them. Goes out and finds them. He came in active obedience, fulfilling the law of God perfectly. And in his passive obedience, he goes to the cross. And he bears the wrath of God. The sky becomes dark and God pours out his wrath on the Son that we deserve. God poured out hell on his Son. As Brother Mike said earlier, you know, either Christ paid the penalty for your sin, or you'll bear it for all of eternity. And I think we need to be serious in telling this to people. 
And I agree wholeheartedly when he said, I don't believe many Christians today take that to heart. They don't believe that Jesus is going to judge. See, people aren't going to stand before God the Spirit. They're going to stand before God the Son. They're going to stand before Him who is the God-Man. And He's going to bring judgment. As I read earlier in John chapter 5, all authority has been given to the Son. And He's going to judge. So they'll be judged by man. You know, we need to remind people, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So Jesus goes to the cross. God pours out his wrath upon him. He gives up his last breath. He says it is finished. The penalty was paid on the stripes of Christ Jesus. And then they bury him in the ground. Why did they bury him? Because he was dead. He actually died. You know, we need to keep that in mind. And then the probably the most important thing is that he rose from the grave on the third day. You know, we need to keep that in mind when we go to share the gospel with people, because usually that's what people leave out. They leave out the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But if you look through the book of Acts, every time they go to share the gospel, they're talking about the risen Christ. They're talking about him who rose from the grave on the third day, defeating death, hell, and the grave. The grave could not hold him because it was without sin. He was the perfect man, the God-man. Christ Jesus, the Lord. And like Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he talks about, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our faith is in vain. We serve the risen Christ. Our faith is in a real person who's alive today. We need to remind people that Jesus, that he lived a perfect life, that he went to the cross, that he died, he rose from the grave on the third day, but that he's coming back again. He's coming back to judge the living and the dead. One day we'll all give an account. Well, men will give an account to him. He's not coming back spiritually, but he's coming back physically. He's not coming back as a baby in the manger, but he's coming back as a lion of the tribe of Judah, dead vengeance upon his enemies. So here, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we need to talk about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. My Father who is in heaven. So when we go out to share the gospel, and it seems like nobody is responding, we need to realize that it's not our work to do to make people believe. It's not our work to convince Muslims that, that Jesus is God and that, that of how they can be saved. You know, we're, our, we're called to share the message. And as Jesus responded to Peter, that this is something that is revealed. Uh, it's revealed by the Holy Spirit. It's revealed by the Father who is in heaven. And it's not our job to, again, to convince people and make them to believe that. And then here it says, Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. I know it, it seemed odd that he would charge him not to tell, not to say that. But the thing is, it wasn't the right time for, for them to declare Jesus as the Christ. He said that there were still things that he needed to fulfill. Namely, go to the cross, die and be raised from the grave on the third day. And then after that, he gives them the charge to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, to go in and make disciples. And that's the same thing that we're called to do as well. We have that same charge to go out and preach this good news of Jesus Christ to the world. Now, in reaching Muslims, I think there's certain things that we need to do. And the first thing is that we need to know our Bible. We need to know our Bible from Genesis to Revelation to be able to answer the questions that people pose to us, we need to be sound in our doctrine and theology. We need to be rooted and grounded in the truth. We have the truth. And this is what we need to take to the world. That God might sanctify them as well in the truth. Uh, we have the gospel. We, have what it, we know what it is to be a true Christian. 
The Bible is our authority. It's a weapon that, that we need to take with us. Carry it with us. I mean, I know we have it on our phones, but I think, you know, we can always carry a small Bible with us. We can carry a Gideon's Bible, a New Testament in our pocket. And just be willing and ready to share this with people. Our authority is in the Quran. We want to speak with authority, so we're going to speak from the Scriptures. We want, we want our Muslim friend to be able to read from the Scriptures. So one of the things that I, that I like to do is, I don't usually highlight, but I use a pencil. I use a straight edge and a pencil. It looks very clean. It's straight. And you can say, read right here. And show them where they need to read from the Scriptures, where it's talking about Jesus being God. Um, like I said, we need to pull this out and use it. We need to recommend to our Muslim friend that he needs to read the Bible. Ask him, have you ever read the Bible? You know, we were in England not too long ago, and we had come back at the end of the day. We walked through this, through this village to go to the house that we were staying at, and there would be some Muslim men out there. They would have a table, they'd have Qurans and different things out there. And if we would walk by, and I think the first time when we saw them, we just engaged them. And these guys had their little notepads with their little uh, rejections of who God was. You know, and their little, little tricks, you know, trying to twist the word of God. You know, but we could open up the Bible and say, well, this is actually what it says. Let's look and see what the Bible says, not what your, what your little note there says. We need to, also, we need to have a, a well-kept Bible. If, if we take a, a Bible off that's kind of ratted up on the streets and the Muslims aren't going to, you know, they see it as being the Word of God that it should be exalted. I think we should see it the same way as well. So maybe keep a, an extra Bible to witness to uh, your Muslim friend. And I think it's good to, to use, most of the time we recommend John to people uh, to, to start the Bible. I think it's good to start with other Matthew or Luke and sharing the gospel with our Muslim friends. Because it has more stories in it, and I think they're drawn to the different stories. That same group of men, um, you know, that we came in contact with, there was a young man, and he just broke my heart every time that I saw him. So we, we probably saw these guys maybe five or six times as we were coming back. I think it got to a point where they would, one of the leaders, would, he would like wave his hand saying, no, 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 don't engage these guys. Because every time we would engage them, we would just stir up the, the whole area. And then we just got to a certain point where one of us would just break off and preach to the, to the crowd that was forming them. Um, so we need to know our Bible too. We, we need not fear Muslims. You know, we're, we're living in a world that's full of fear. So in our time in Europe, people come over to us while we're preaching and they say, I'm, I'm afraid. They're afraid of the Muslims. Actually, we were at a conference last week and I heard another man say that sitting in the back of the room. He says, they're, they're trying to kill us. They're trying to kill us. I go, maybe they are. To live as Christ, to die is gain, right? But I think, in, for the most part, they're not trying to kill us. They want to live good lives. They want to be religious people. You know, their job is to try to convert us as well. But they're not trying to kill us. You know, you have to think that they're indoctrinated from birth to believe that Jesus isn't God and that he didn't die on the cross. We have to correct them using the word of God. But we're not going to correct them if we're fearing man. We're not going to say anything. We're not going to open our mouth. I spent, uh, well, as most of you know, I was in the, in the military for 20 years. A part, of my, a part of my time in the military, I ran a school. I ran a school for two years. I taught people how to shoot guns. Big guns. And I taught people how to defend themselves against terrorists. I was talking about Bin Laden before me. Most people knew him as Bin Laden. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, we just have this fear of people we think that are, that are trying to kill us. And I, actually this is something that, that, that I had to deal with. You know, because, you know, for after 9-11, it was like, oh yeah, game on. Game on. We're going to go on and take out as many terrorists as we can. But going out in the streets, I have to see them as, not as my enemy, but as my neighbor. And so that's something that I have to deal with. We never need not fear that the, all Muslims are part of ISIS, that, that they're extremists or terrorists. We need to avoid stereotypes. They're created in the image and the likeness of God. 
just like us, that they're souls, souls that need to be saved. We need not fear man. Like I said, they're not our enemy. And we don't need to be negative. I don't think we need to bash the Quran and Muhammad to share the gospel with people. That's not the gospel. I think there's some people out today, they go and they preach the gospel, they feel that they need to say that Muhammad's a rapist and a pedophile. We don't need to do that. We're going to lose our hearer when we start insulting uh, their people and their prophet. I, I say we can talk to them about the Quran. It doesn't contain the truth. And we're going to lift up the, the Bible. We're going to lift up Christ. We're going to preach Christ, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We don't want to embarrass upset our Muslim friends. They might get upset over the gospel. Let the gospel be the offense, not us talking about the Quran and, and who Muhammad is. Um, we lose our hearer. We need to preach the word. We need to be ready in season and out of season. We need to preach the gospel. We need to preach God and who he is. Men as sinners, Christ as the Savior. The man's response to that is to repent and believe the gospel. We need to speak the truth in love. We need to avoid useless confrontations. We need to be kind and gentle. Have to teach, just like it calls for us in 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 to 26. And I think the best way to interact with Muslims is in one-to-one -one conversations. We can get them, when we can talk to them, you know, so they don't, they don't feel like they have to defend Islam in front of their friend. I think it's good if we can get them off to the side, and then go through the scriptures, let them ask their questions. Where in the Bible does Jesus say that I am God? Here, I can show you right here, my friend. But are you going to bend the knee to him when I show it to you? They're, they're like a community religion. They're all like a, like a big family. So when we get, get them and we embarrass them, or they don't want to be embarrassed. So let's just keep that in mind. It's easier to talk to them one to one. We need to ask good questions. One of the questions that I like to start off with is, are you a good Muslim? I just ask them that, see what they would say. And then if they say that they're a good Muslim, I would say, how does a good Muslim get to heaven? I ask, how are your sins forgiven? A couple weeks ago or, or a month ago, one kid could say, why do you keep asking me that question? I go, because you haven't given me an answer. And they have no answer. We have the answer. So we're called to declare that answer to them. Ask them, have you read the Bible? You know, they might, they might say that they have, but ask them some questions about the Bible. I ask them, um, if you died today, would your religion give you everything that it promises you? What, what are those promises? And how do you know for sure that you would receive those promises? And like Brother Mike brought up, why did Jesus have to die? That's another good question you can bring up to them. You know, and then you just use it. Go into the law, bring the law and the gospel to bear upon their hearts. Um, Islam, they have their five pillars. You know, they have uh, their profession of faith, um, their prayers, their giving alms, fasting, and their pilgrimage to, to Mecca. We need to share with them the five pillars of Christianity. Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Sola Gratia, Solus Christus, Soli Deo Glory. These are the things that we need to share with them. We can use that to, to preach the gospel to them. And the next thing is that we need, to, we need to pray. We need to pray that God would give us souls, that he would give us opportunities. He's going to give us lots of opportunities over the next few years to witness to our Muslim friends. You know, we see a lot on the college campuses. Do you realize that these people, that they're sent here from their, from their countries to get an education? It's a perfect place for us to witness to young Muslims. Because they can go back home and speak the language to their people, you know, praying that God would save them. You know, that they could go back. You know, so we need to pray for opportunities. We need to pray that God would open up their eyes to the truth, that he would prepare us. That we would go deeper into the scriptures to know the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That we need to be prepared to do this.
From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. That's the message that we're called to declare. Christ raised from the grave. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Satan has distorted the message to the Muslims and how they can be saved, denying that Jesus is God and he didn't go to the cross. And if Jesus didn't go to the cross, he didn't raise, wasn't raised from the grave. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We need to tell our Muslim friends and everybody, this is something that we usually leave off. That there's a cost. There's a cost to following Christ. We know he offers salvation as a free gift. And men are called to deny themselves, to turn away from the things of the world, to follow him. Our Muslim friends realize that. If they turn away from Islam, you know, they're going to be persecuted. They might be killed by their families. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What shall a man give in return for a soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will pay each person according to what he has done. We need to consider that. that there's a day coming when all men are going to stand before God and give an account of their lives. At the point when a person wants to die and then the judgment. We need to be prepared to share the good news of the gospel with our Muslim friends, telling them that you know, if you gained everything, what would, it, what would it mean for your soul? So we need to ask God that he would give us souls to say, speaking to our Muslim friends. <coughs> I went to the UAE a couple years ago, and I went to Abu Dhabi, it's in the Middle East. And I took a bunch of traps with me, with some Bibles in Arabic. It was very difficult for me to share the gospel. I, because I knew that, you know, if I gave away Bibles, I would be thrown in jail. So what I did was, I would just try to give the tracts as, as best I could. And I met a young man. He asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm an evangelist. He said, I am too. And uh, he was Pakistani. And he says, you want to go with me to, to witness? I go, yeah, sure. Let's go. It was a little bit different. You know, because nobody spoke English. We went to Pakistani Muslims. And uh, I remember just being in a room with, the, with these 14 guys. It was very dark in there. And all I could do was pray. You know, just, just pray that God would give us opportunities. I handed out my tracts. I didn't talk to anybody because I didn't speak the language. And then that young man... I said, I have these Bibles. He says, I'll take them. I'll give them away. So let's do the same. Let's be prepared with tracts and Bibles. Let's be prepared to open our mouths to witness to our Muslim neighbors. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this privilege and this opportunity to speak your word, to speak the truth. Lord, I pray that the saints would be encouraged to seek out their Muslim neighbors to go and to share the good news of the gospel with them, Father God. Lord, I pray that you would break our hearts, that you would give us urgency, Lord, that you would open our mouths, that you would guide us, keep us, Lord, that you would teach us the truth of your word, Lord, that we would be prepared to answer that question, who do you say that I am? That we would declare you as the Christ, the Son, of the living God. Lord, that we would not let Satan hinder us. Lord, and that we would go and declare this truth to a lost and dying world. With this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>